everybody and welcome back to Blood Matters, a podcast for nurses. Thank you very much for joining us today for another podcast. I'm your one of your hosts, Emma Chalmers, and I'm joined, as always, by Michelle. Hi, Michelle. How are you? I'm great. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, I, I, I have to comment. Uh, for those of you who are listening on Spotify, you won't you won't get this, but um, Emma's hair looks like a natural colour today. And uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an ob- observation. I feel that I should... Uh, I should make uh anything anything makes you uh have a, a natural hair day as opposed to a uh pink or blue hair day Emma is that no. to do with mood at all ever no it's literally that the purple is growing out and I've got a hairband in to keep it off my face and so if you saw the back of my head it would be lilac um okay. but interesting I was thinking about dyeing it again yesterday so who knows what color it'll be next week who knows Excellent. I was uh, I was wondering if there was an uh, an association with uh, with mood and and how we express ourselves. Uh, thinking, segueing into the topic for today. It's a nice segue. It's a nice segue. Um, so on that note, guys, we're going to talk about mental health and about our mental health um, when we're looking after our patients. Um, and so we've got some cracking guests today. Um, I think that it's going to be a really interesting conversation. Uh, I will say to the listeners, though, just a bit of a content warning. This might be difficult co- topics and difficult to listen to. So do please make sure that you're safe when you're listening and you're prepared to listen to potentially some hard things that we're going to discuss. But I think they're really important, aren't they, Michelle? Yeah, and I think it is, you know, we talk about mental health and it, it almost becomes, you know, a word without necessarily uh, meaning because, yeah. you know, we're we're using the words uh, much more commonly nowadays. But, you know, what we want to do in the pod today is really normalise talking about uh, mental health and the mental health issues that uh, healthcare workers uh, especially those working under pressure or working yeah. with uh, emotional distress and uh, challenging situations with patients and families. Um, but, but you know, we want to add some meaning to those words yes. and really try to, with our guests, offer some uh, ideas around how people might talk about their mental health issues, recognise mental health issues within themselves, um, and, you know, the kind of common uh, signs and uh, some of the triggers and uh, very importantly, of course, where people can seek help uh, and importantly, uh, where they can seek help confidentially. Yes. Uh, and how that uh, doesn't uh, doesn't compromise uh, professional integrity and, and those professional boundaries that that are really, really important. Um, yeah. so we have two amazing uh, guests this morning. Uh, I'm just going to introduce our, our first guest. Perfect. We have yeah. Sarabi Chattaverdi. Uh, I have the privilege to work with Sarabi. She's a senior psychotherapist in our team uh, and leads the team of psychosocial support in hemato-oncology. Uh, so stem cell transplant and cellular therapies as well at King's College Hospital in London. And she really specialises in assessing and supporting psychological needs of not just patients, but also their families, uh, those of those that are affected by hematological malignancies at various uh, points in treatment pathway from diagnosis really to beyond treatment. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I see patients in our long term follow up clinic. Uh, who I refer on uh, back for support or assessment and and signposting. Uh, So the work that that Sarabi and her team do are amazing. And, you know, not only for the patients, but also raise the narrative and, 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 uh, you know, spotlight the conversation around mental health. Uh, So it enables a high level of comfort among our colleagues for for recognising and talking about mental health challenges. She also runs uh, supervision sessions for uh, nurses and other multidisciplinary team colleagues. So she's well used to working with uh, health professionals uh, around, you know, the psychological aspects of cancer care and also self-care for, for people working with 
with patients in these uh, highly emotive environments. Uh, she does a lot of public speaking. Uh, she's uh, talked at uh, conferences like REBMT uh, and uh, ESH and also ESMO and uh, British Society for Hematology. Uh, and she works with a background of clinical psychology uh, and also integrative psychotherapy. So she's a, she's an incredible individual and we're really, really blessed to, to work with her and have her on the pod today. Yes, and over I'm to really you intrigued. to introduce Ross. I'm really intrigued. Um, so the uh, second guest that we have uh, is Ross, as Michelle said, so Ross McIntosh. So Ross doesn't work for uh, a health service. Ross is freelance work and coaching psychologist. He also has his own little podcast that we'll give a little gen, gen, um, generous plug to. So uh, it's the People Soup podcast, which looks at unlocking workplace at workplace potential by making behavioral science accessible, useful and fun. So that way that we can use that science to make ourselves a bit better. Um, Ross also works as a researcher and is an honorary visiting lecturer at City University of London. He designs and delivers workplace interventions that cultivate awareness, adaptability, authentic action and psychological well-being at work. So he's going to be great for us as today. He's got a huge client roster, so over 20 NHS trusts in the UK, nursing directors internationally, and then also works across the arts, business and other healthcare to provide that psychological well-being support. So really big scope of experience and knowledge that we're bringing to the podcast with Ross today. So I think our two guests are going to be fantastic at helping us unlock our ability to to cope well with what we're dealing with. And I think it's important to note that it doesn't matter that if someone's struggling, that they're still going to be an absolutely excellent carer for their patients just sometimes we recognize that we need some help we've all been there I think haven't we so with that in mind uh let's get the pot the guys on the pod and let's get cracking with the questions hi guys welcome to our podcast thank you very much for joining us how are you doing today I'm very well thanks good and Saravi are you well Yes, very well. Thanks, Emma. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us. So um, the way that we do the pod, as always, is we'll ask one guest a bunch of questions and then the second guest, and then we'll bring you back in for a quick fire round uh, where the questions are short and the answers are short. And then we will close it all off again. And thank you for joining us. So we'll start with Ross. Uh, thanks for joining us, as I've said. Um, first of all, Ross, just can you tell us a bit about what you do? Who are you? What do you do? Wow, that's a big question, Emma, but I'll give it a go. <laughs> I'm an organizational and coaching psychologist and I'm freelance, but a really important part of my role. In fact, what I consider to be the most important part of my role is my partnership with Dr. Paul Flaxman at City University of London. And we work as a kind of combo. Uh, he's the researcher, I'm the practitioner. And this okay. enables us to design workplace interventions together, which I then go on to deliver and he researches. And all of our work is underpinned by a branch of behavioral science called acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT. Now, don't be alarmed by the word therapy, because my mate Paul has been researching ACT-based interventions in the workplace for nigh on 20 years. Okay. And it's a great training to deliver in the workplace, as it focuses on the development of skills really practical skills, skills we probably weren't taught at school or our further professional education. So that's that's a little bit about me. That sounds really interesting, but we're going to deep dive a bit further anyway. But Michelle's got your next question. Yeah, thanks very much, Ross. So how common are mental health issues with health professionals? Wow. Well, I'd start by saying I think mental health issues are common across all professions. Mm -hmm. And I think there may be different facets that we see in health professionals and different um, perhaps conditions, particularly thinking about the pandemic. But as an example, some of our research taking the public sector as a whole, which included a large proportion of NHS health professionals, our research suggested that between 40 and 50% of people who volunteered to attend one of our skills-based training programs 
were experiencing borderline clinical levels of psychological distress. Which is, to be honest, Michelle, that's what gets me up in the morning. The, the the concern that that people in our workplaces and in health professionals, around about half could be experiencing borderline clinical levels of mental distress at any one time. And that would typically take the form of depression, anxiety, or stress. And the more positive news is that, that after a four-session training program with us, all participants were well below the clinic all participants were well below the clinical level on a measure called the general health questionnaire. So our trainings fit designed to fit the preventative side of mental health to equip professionals with the skills that can help them relate to their jobs differently, whilst also looking after themselves. But Ross, so clarify for me, if, if distress is borderline, why does it matter? Well, it's, it's borderline tipping over into the clinical, which can then have an enormous impact on that individual. But if that individual is also coming to work because perhaps they just feel motivated to keep going because of their deep desire to support and be compassionate with others, then they'll also impact on everyone around them. And there's a strong evidence base for this acceptance and commitment therapy in the workplace, it's shown to significantly reduce burnout. It's shown to reduce worry and rumination outside of working hours. And that's so important. If, if a health professional gets home from a long shift and is at home and their mind is still in the workplace, dwelling on that stuff or worrying about the next shift, that's not a healthy state for us to be in as human beings. Another beautiful feature I think of ACT is that these skills can be practiced in any area of life. It's not just about that individual's relationship with their work. So for me, as you might have gathered, I'm really passionate about delivering ACT because we've got yeah. such a strong evidence base. And and it'll be interesting to hear <laughs> later on other ways in which health professionals might work with techniques that might mm. not be act based. I'm sure you know we'll we'll cover some of those uh, those pieces later on in the, in the pod as as you're talking about about that. I'm going to hand over back to Emma now. So it's it's really interesting, and actually that number was quite surprising to me, Ross. That I, I think I knew, but I think I didn't have that number in the forefront of my mind so how do the skills that you share in your training and contribute to improving mental health so how do they how do they bring our patient off that uh, our colleague off that precipice well i would say nothing in life is ever guaranteed but these True. skills can really support people in in three ways if maybe if i just introduce the three skills we we, we break it down into three really practical skills and we call them noticing, active, and open. So noticing is about, can we notice how we're showing up in the world, how we're being with our colleagues, with our patients, with our families, with our friends? Because we don't always notice. Mm -hmm. We don't always notice those behavioral patterns that might be so embedded that we just do them automatically. We also maybe don't notice that stuff inside of our heads. The stuff inside of our heads that... Between, that's happening between our ears that's generated by our minds to keep us safe but sometimes that stuff isn't too helpful and it can really keep us stuck in unproductive loops things like i'm not clever enough or i'm not good enough or it's all going to go wrong those thoughts are normal i'm going to repeat that those thoughts are normal but sometimes we pay a hundred percent of our attention to those thoughts but what we can do, we can develop skills to relate to those thoughts in a different way. And that that's kind of the open element of the skills. It's recognizing that we have these thoughts and there are skills, evidence-based skills that we can learn to lessen their impact in our lives and help yeah. us recognize what's important. And that takes me to the final skill, which is called active. And that's about just pressing pause and thinking, what matters to me about my work? How do I want to be? How do I want to show up? 
And if we start to think about that, and maybe the qualities of behavior that we want to bring to how we are as a, for example, a health professional, I would call those personal values. Mm -hmm. And if we can get used to connecting with those personal values and using them as a guide for how we behave and how we show up in our professional lives, it's not always easy, but that can give us more satisfaction. It can improve our well-being. And it can improve our general vitality about our career and our future prospects. That sounds great. I'm thinking about this pause and that some healthcare professionals, myself included, are not very good at pausing because we're always so busy. So we're always rushing. We've got six tasks ahead in the to-do list as we do one now. So it's interesting about that pause because I think that I would personally find that quite difficult, but I also completely see the benefit of that and actually stopping and saying, where am I now? What am I doing? So mm. it sounds, sounds brilliant. Um, so we'll keep going, but I mean, as always, I'm scribbling notes down, guys. We know that I do this. Um, Michelle has your next question, uh, Ross, yeah. but thank you for that. That's really triggering a thought process in my head. So I just want to talk a bit more about, about that pause and, and what's the relationship between that pause and the stuff that nurses do or are encouraged to do in terms of reflection and reflective practices? Is that a similar thing or is that different from that pause? I, I would say, Michelle, it's really similar. I think sometimes we're careering through our... I, I, just cannot comprehend how busy health professionals are particularly environments where there's a shortage of staff there's extra pressures there's all sorts of stuff going on but if we can work out a way to find that time to pause and reflect we can grow we can improve and we can learn from what's been happening trouble is sometimes we're just so focused on doing 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 yeah. because that's the, the 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 motivation to radiate that compassion and that con care for other human beings. So the pause can be a macro pause where you sit down and you reflect, or it could be a micro pause as you, and forgive me, I have to say to your listeners, I'm obviously not a health professional. So I can only bring the tools from behavioral science to reflect on how I believe things might be for you but mm -hmm. you are the expert in what you do but um if we can perhaps in a busy day just take a moment to pause and breathe maybe just look out of the window or if we're going from patient to patient can we pause before we go to that next patient just take a breath and think how do I want to be with this next patient can I connect with now because sometimes we get tangled up in our heads and we're caught about maybe a previous thing that happened that day. And how could we be most present with that fellow human in front of us? Thanks, Ross. I, I think that we're, we are sort of drilled to be reflective as, mm -hmm. as nurses. And uh, even sometimes that sort of continual reflection, whether we acknowledge that that's happening or, or not, can in itself be exhausting and uh, and can feel sort of slightly detrimental, um, particularly if we use that in a in a negative way. So to to self, as a self critique mechanism, um, it can feel uh, can feel uh, perhaps not as positive always as we might wish it to be. So um, I guess there's something there in that in that pause that. Uh, acknowledging that it's not always going to feel like a positive process and how we how we use those tools to emerge feeling more understood or understanding ourselves better or um kind of with that layer of skill that we might want to acquire through that through that mm. process um, so i'm going to move on tonight sorry sorry ross I was just going to make a, a little point there, Michelle. Yeah, when we reflect, we typically, we have this bias to reflect on all the things that went wrong that day mm -hmm. or how, 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 I was, how I was an idiot in that presentation or that didn't go so well or all the things I haven't done on my to-do list. That could be a reflection. And yeah. I'm guessing that you and your listeners 
are probably your own harshest critics. I would just like to flag that we probably talk to ourselves in a way that we would never talk to our closest friends or the people we love. We've got this really harsh attitude towards ourselves. So when we're doing that pause, we like to encourage a, a stance or a position of curiosity and kindness towards ourselves. I think health professionals are nurses are super good at radiating compassion and care to others. But when you ask them to turn that compassion and care onto themselves, they're kind of, in my sort of anecdotal experience, they kind of get a bit uncomfortable. Like, no, I just need to crack on. I'm all right. No, look over there. They want to distract you from it. They don't want to, to take that care and compassion and direct it towards themselves. They're, they're not entirely comfortable with that. I think a lot of people will be able to recognize what you're saying there, yes. Ross. Absolutely. Um, that, that will definitely be chiming with some people who are listening. Um, so just to move things on just a, a little bit and kind of slightly change topic a little bit to something that I think is probably a little more difficult to talk about, although a lot of these things can be difficult for different people. Uh, and what we want to talk about now is a little bit about uh, about addiction and self-harm and suicide. And we hear about these, uh, you know, on, on the news or in the media um, and, uh, you know, very occasionally we will meet uh, colleagues who uh, may be feeling uh, the, this sort of level of distress um and you know so we read or hear about about addiction or self-harm and suicide in in health professionals can you share some of your insights around this in some of the people that you might have worked with and uh how that's kind of maybe manifested or you know how we recognize maybe when our, our colleagues mm. are experiencing difficulty um or we might recognize it in ourselves yeah, yeah, a, a great topic and one definitely worth exploring. And I'd like to to explore it from an, the perspective of organiz organizational psychology, which is which is my specialism. I'm thinking about how teams, individuals, and hospitals work. And I think there are two contexts that contribute to our mental health or two environments. There's a there's an external context. It's what's happening in a hospital at a team level with those patients with complex requirements. There's all the stuff going on outside of us. And there's an internal context. There's the stuff that's going on inside our heads in the rest of our lives that maybe other people don't see, other people don't know about. So it's this it's this balance of things, but I'll maybe I'll talk about external first because that can really impact upon our health and our well-being and lead to behavior that's not always in the interests of our long-term health. So for the external environment, the first thing we need to do is listen to the experts. That is the people performing the job on the day-to-day -day basis, gathering their views and ideas because they are the people most skilled at doing that job in that environment. And so often they don't have a voice. We could also look at the workplace through a lens of the theory. This is a different to act. This is a theory called basic psychological needs. And use that as a lens to support, to explore this external context. And there are three components, which I thought it might be just interesting for your listeners to share. There are three components of this theory called autonomy, belonging and competence and all of these can be at risk we can look out for these in ourselves and others to look out for kind of warning signs or signs that we need to pay attention in one of these areas so autonomy is represents having freedom and influence and control over what we're doing and that control also means controlling the boundaries between our home and work lives and also setting routines and behaviors, something which in my experience, health professionals aren't good at, routines and behaviors to look after ourselves. Then belonging. As human beings, we have this fundamental innate need to belong. This means to feel connected with others, to feel valued, to feel like we're seen and we're heard and we're supported by others. 
And if we're feeling that the environment is not supporting or feeling inner conflict, we can tend to withdraw when what we actually need to do is, is enhance those connections and that soothing we get from other humans. We need to be able to receive both emotional and informational support. So you need to know who to approach for help about your new reporting system or a new treatment. But you also need those social and emotional connections. And then the third one is competence, which refers to feelings that we can accomplish things and get things done. So we're able to grow and learn as an individual, both in work and outside of work. And that speaks to those reflection points, perhaps, but also to reflect on the small things we've done every day to maybe enhance our competence, the things we've learned. And then just thinking, that's the external context, thinking about the internal context, what's going on between our ears. If we're experiencing those thoughts, emotions, that can feel quite compelling, things like, this is just unsupportable, I can't continue in this type of work, um, it's all going to go wrong. I'm going to be discovered as the fraud that I am. Sometimes to get away from those uncomfortable feelings inside of us, we move towards things that aren't beneficial for our long-term health, such as addictions and other behavior that, that isn't that fulfilling for us. But it helps block that that uncomfortable feeling inside of us. And as you'll gather, I'm not a clinical psychologist, I'm a, an organizational psychologist. But what our training focuses on is equipping adults to move through life in a way that has purpose and meaning for them and relating to the, all that critical and helpful stuff in a different way, which can be quite liberating. And it takes practice because we've lived with these unhelpful thoughts for a long time. Thanks, Ross. I just want to bring Sarabi in uh, now, if that's okay. And just um, just because I, we won't touch on this topic uh, so specifically again in, in the pod and really just to see if Sarabi had any any reflections or any thoughts or insights to, to bring to this. To the question of uh, very difficult problems like addiction, suicide. Yes. Yeah. I think it's absolutely vital that mechanisms of support are in place for people struggling with these problems and I yeah. think the problem sometimes within healthcare is we don't know that help is available for us as practitioners as well uh, these are if, if somebody has developed an addiction or is having thoughts about harming themselves in some way that's distress of an intensity or level that maybe cannot be self-managed and requires yeah from a trained mental health professional yeah. and and there's that there, so I I think it's very important to build on what Ross was saying I absolutely agree with what Ross was saying about kind of having this ongoing practice and commitment to bettering our mental health but on top of that for some people who are experiencing very severe emo emotional distress um, support needs to be provided from within the organization or from primary health care in the community um, and there has to be recognition of that. And, and I think sometimes the culture in healthcare is such that you soldier on and, you know, carry on doing the job in very difficult circumstances. But this is one where I think it's important that staff members, managers and senior leadership takes a real compassionate and caring approach um, and doesn't expect someone to just carry on working when they're having distress of this intensity. Thank you, Sarabi. That's really helpful. I'm going to just hand over to uh, Emma now. Yeah, thank you, um, for both of you. Those are they're really um, thought provoking. Ross, just just coming towards the end of your first part of your questions, but um, the question I have for you now is just thinking about what kind of situations or environments do we see that contributing to or triggering some mental health issues so so should nurses working in challenging environments with high levels of emotional distress um and long stay patients in particular take steps to look after themselves i think i know the answer is yes but but maybe mm. what are they yeah my brief answer is hell yeah and <laughs> yeah. but if we look at the 
I was reading a report from the King's Fund, which talked about staff stress, absenteeism, presenteeism, turnover, and intentions to quit had reached alarming levels amongst yes. nurses and midwives. In, and this was late 2019. And an RCN employment survey suggested nearly a quarter of nurses and midwives were looking for a job outside the NHS. And then another NHS survey said 44% of nurses and midwives indicated that they had been unwell as a result of work-related stress in the previous 12 months, which chimes with our own research. And more than half reported attending work in the past three months, despite not feeling well enough to perform their duties. And that, what, what is so startling about that data, that is pre-pandemic. Yeah. So absolutely. My experience of working with Hundreds of healthcare professionals is self-care can slip down the to-do list. There's a danger in these types of situations that nurses don't turn off. From, from our work with hundreds of nurses, one of the most revealing findings, because we interviewed some of the recipients of the training, was that after the training, nurses felt like they had permission to look after themselves. Because I think before they perhaps considered it was self-indulgent or a bit selfish, but actually it helped change their mindset and recognize that they need to look after themselves in every area of life, from their work to their relationships, to their leisure time and their own health. And there's really strong evidence that what we do in our leisure time can really impact on how we recharge our batteries and how we equip ourselves with energy to to return to the workplace. And there's some very simple steps that you might have heard of the five ways to well-being, which are really enshrined in evidence. And this, you'll notice how this chimes with the basic psychological needs, but it's about connecting with others, getting active, whether that activity is some light stretching, whether that activity is running a marathon, whatever it might be, some activity, taking notice about what's going on around us using our five senses, developing a learning stance. And this isn't an, uh, like I'm going to learn Mandarin. It's just learning around new things, new activities in life. And the, the other one in the five steps to ways to well-being is give. Give a little bit of time to someone else or give a little bit of attention or maybe rekindle that friendship that's been neglected for a while just by dropping them a quick message yeah I think the the expression I like to use is you can't pour from an empty cup and most of our nurses will probably say that to patients and relatives but not apply it to themselves and say well I need to be well in order to be able to do my job um in a functional way and we obviously I I certainly feel this the same myself is that my role is a part of who I am and how I define myself as a person. So it's not as easy to switch off at the end of the day because I, I identify with a lot of what I do in terms of my entire life. Okay, so I think we've just got one wee question left for you, Ross, before we um, we t go over to Sarabi. But you might have already kind of answered it in an earlier um, an earlier comment. So Michelle, just I'll you see what you would like to do here yeah I, I think Ross it, you know maybe a quite a bit of a summary really of, of, of yeah. what you've talked about would be would be great really just a quick kind of you know in response to sort of signs that we might see in our colleagues experiencing distress you know in 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 the workplace um you know the 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 less obvious signs you know I guess I guess a bit of a wrap up of, of what you've talked mm. about really how how we can look after our colleagues or how we can uh notice mm. um within colleagues yeah that noticing for me is key if we can notice how we are ourselves and if we're noticing distress if we can reach out to others but also if we're being vigilant about our colleagues and, and extending that compassion to them if you notice a behavior change. And a couple of things just to reflect on to finish is, I was speaking to a nurse uh, recently who said, but the problem is you can pour from an empty cup, you can keep mm -hmm. going. And that really struck me. And it made me think of the how 
burnout has been included now as an occupational phenomenon by the World Health Organization. And it's characterized by three dimensions, feelings of energy depletion and exhaustion, increased mental distance from one's job or feelings of negativism and cynicism related to one's job and reduced professional efficacy. So maybe they are things to look out for in each other. And maybe we'd say, gosh, I'm feeling all of those. But I guess my, my final point would be, we can develop skills that we weren't probably taught in our childhood or in our further professional education that can really help us navigate the complex and challenging demands of the healthcare profession. That's amazing. Thank you very much. Very, all very thought provoking. And I, I really hope that people who are listening in have, have been able to really kind of get the perspective and, uh, and, you know, kind of think about the relevance of, of the things that you've talked about, Ross, to themselves and their practice uh, and to their colleagues in the workplace. So, Ravi, we're going to move along on to yourself now. I'm going to hand back to Emma. Thank you very much. Uh, stay with us, Ross, because we have got a couple more later on for you. But, Sarabi, thank you again for joining us. Um, so just to start off the questions, it would be great if you could just tell us a bit about your role in, in your work. I'm the lead psychotherapist of a small psychological support team embedded within the haematology and transplant team at King's College Hospital in London. Uh, primarily, my role is to offer psychological support to patients or family members affected by blood cancers or related conditions from diagnosis onwards uh, at any point that they might need it and for as long as they might need it. Um, my team is also fully embedded within the transplant and hematology MDT. And so part of our role is also to try and bring a holistic and psychologically informed way of thinking about patients and their families. Mm -hmm. um, and also a substantive part of our role is also to offer training, support and consultation to our medical and nursing colleagues which can take the form of um, supervision, uh, education days, as well as just support when something difficult happens or something particularly distressing occurs. That sounds wonderful um, and very uh, busy for you, it, I, would, I would say. Uh, Michelle's got your next question. Uh, thanks very much, Emma. Uh, yeah, I, I I can testify to the uh, small team, massive, enormous difference uh, that having uh, those individuals and that team embedded within our service not only makes to our patients and their families, but but also to the culture within the mm -hmm. within the wider space and team. Um, so, Ravi, I'm going to kick off by asking you about moral distress. I don't think I had heard about moral distress until about six months ago. It sort of feels like it's the new the new phrase. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it and how we might be able to uh, identify it or address it in ourselves and others? Oh, sure. And it's interesting you say that, Michelle. I have a similar feeling that it's been present in conversations I've had with colleagues much more recently. And I think the pandemic really threw that into sharp relief because healthcare professionals were having to make very dis difficult decisions um, in very extraordinary and difficult times. Uh, but moral distress actually was first conceptualized in the early 80s. And it relates to distress that occurs when professionals identify an ethically and morally correct action to take, but are somehow constrained in their ability to take that action. Uh, this is this is I'm paraphrasing a BMA definition of moral distress mm. here. And those those barriers or those constraints in taking that action, they might be institutional, uh, or there might be a moral dilemma or multiple competing moral imperatives, all of which are justifiable in if you look at it a certain way but it leaves the person feeling uneasy somehow. Um, a common example of this, which I think a lot of uh, healthcare professionals in your audience might relate to is when there are bed pressures and patients who need to come in for treatment can't come in. And this is an institutional constraint to somebody being able to do the right thing, which is to give somebody potentially life-saving treatment. And it, it it's definitely something that might generate moral distress for someone. Um, 
if you're in, if listeners are interested, I think it's uh, the BMA published a report on moral distress among healthcare practitioners in 2021, which is available online. And I think a lot of nurses in particular who might be listening might relate to the factors that contribute to moral distress, uh, because there was a lot of data gathered around this. Um, in terms of how we identify it, uh, I'm going to take a leaf out of Ross's book around noticing and developing that self-awareness, but also asking ourselves a few questions about our subjective experience, but doing so with genuine curiosity and compassion. Uh, what I mean is when you notice that something's happened that's left you feeling uneasy, um, try asking yourself, you know, why am I feeling like this? What do I think is the right thing to do here? What are the barriers that are prevented, preventing that thing from happening? Are they internal? Are they external? Are they something I can do something about or are they not? Are they beyond my control? And as to your final point about what can we do about it, I think it's because the factors contributing to it can be interpersonal, internal, or institutional. In a lot of cases, it is institutional stuff. Uh, one of the ways is to create a work culture where moral distress can be named and acknowledged by a team. Um, airing your, our thoughts and emotions really helps us, especially if somebody else also says, I'm feeling the same way. Um, it, it kind of validates our dilemma and it validates how we're feeling about it. And um, and and it, it, it softens the intensity of that experience because then we're not alone in it. Um, yeah. I think, of course, in terms of actual solutions to things that are causing the moral distress, there, there are practical solutions that need to be put in place, uh, but those can feel very beyond us. And I think what we can do in, in our own teams is to create that culture where we name it and we say, this, this is not ideal. This is not how, how we want to be caring for this patient and acknowledge that. Yeah, so so although it becomes a part of, of daily work for some people to uh, experience uh, those situations, the situation that you, you described, it's important not to normalize that and accept that that's... Um, that that's all okay and, and that we work with that I mean we we work with it yes because we we have to do that on a practical level but it's important to acknowledge that this is not the way we would ideally want to be providing care absolutely and it's about recognizing that you know the word moral distress can evoke a lot of it it has it's quite a it's quite a heavy word it's yeah. it's got so much meaning attached to it and it's a value it's a values based word as well yeah and so it's about acknowledging that we feel a certain way about not being able to respond to suffering in the way that we would want to as human beings yeah yeah thank you very much uh, i'm going to hand over to uh, emma Thank you very much. I, I actually hadn't heard the term moral distress until recently too. And and it's funny how we can all identify that we've picked up on it, but maybe we didn't have the language for it now or until now. Um, but all of us are probably thinking about a situation where we've been in moral distress. The question I've got for you next, Sarabi, is it, it's a similar one to we've asked Ross already, but very much want your perspective on this too. And, and so it's around... Do you have any advice for nurses who are worried about a colleague's mental health or them being in distress in any way? Uh, what would you say to them? I mean, rightly, Emma, my answer is not going to be too dissimilar from Ross's, but maybe that's a good thing. I think um, so. And, uh, so I think it starts with turning that lens of care and compassion inwards and also towards our colleagues. In professional caregiving environments and training, it's, we're absolutely taught to hone our skills to empathize and to show compassion and care in one direction, which is from self to patient or self to family member. Um, and, and I wonder whether we can shine that light broadly towards our colleagues as well and have a real commitment towards that. So I think that's the first step. Um, in terms of what one can do, it's about practical gestures. I'm going to use that word that's been mentioned several times is noticing when somebody mm -hmm. is struggling, somebody we're sitting next to is appearing stressed or very quiet or is tearful even. We all work with very challenging situations and patients. And, and quietly just acknowledging acknowledging that kindly to them, saying, you know, are you okay? It, it, I, I, I completely get that sounded like a really tough conversation. You know, if someone's just come off the phone and breathes a sigh, a huge sigh, you know, just saying that sounded really tough. I only heard yeah. once, 
you know, that sounded really difficult. It can really tell that other person that somebody here cares about my well-being enough to notice and acknowledge that I had a tough moment. Um, to take it a step further, if you if you notice somebody is struggling at a level which is um, maybe more than what you commonly see in your colleagues or at an intensity that is impairing their ability to do their job at a standard that you know they're capable of doing it or it's... Um, you know, you can see that it's causing a lot of distress. Or to go back to Michelle's earlier question to Ross around suicidal thoughts, self harm. If it if it if we if it comes to our notice that somebody is struggling with suicidal thoughts, for example, I think it's really important that firstly we don't feel like it is our individual duty to do something about that. I think I'm all in favor of people utilizing existing hierarchies of support that exist within nursing or within medicine in order to get the person support from the channels that are set out to check in and care for their welfare. So for example, um, if I were to struggle, if I were a nurse and I, I saw somebody or somebody, a, a colleague had told me that they're really struggling with their mental health or they're feeling depressed, um, I would maybe take that to somebody higher up, but it's really important to do that in a compassionate and kind and non-judgmental way rather than an accusatory way. Yeah. Uh, and say, look, I'm really worried. Maybe it might, be, I'm just feeding this back to you because it's not my place but perhaps you could check in with them at your next one-to-one -one or arrange a time to speak with them. And that way we utilize the mechanisms that already exist so that we don't feel like we have to suddenly upscale ourselves and help somebody with suicidal thoughts. Yeah. We don't let it, we don't just leave it or ignore it either. Yeah. yeah. And again, I think the, the thing to emphasize here is the better we get at noticing and managing our own distress, the more available we'll be to support other people. Yeah. Um, because otherwise, if I'm in a state of stress, then I, I don't have the capacity. My field of vision narrows. I don't have the capacity to listen out for the distress of others so much. And I think capacity is a really great word there, isn't it? It's about how much you have available to to give to another. Um, that answer is fantastic. And I think it leads really nicely onto Michelle's next question for you. So thank you so much. I'll be back in a next question. Uh, thanks, Emma. Uh, so, so this question is really around self care strategies, and you know, starting with with the individual, and uh, just really some ideas, really to throw out. Uh, I know Ross mentioned some earlier um, uh, with the five ways to well being, but uh, anything else to add there around self care that can help to reduce the risk of of developing some of these issues. Yeah, I mean, and, and again, it's 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 a, a lot of what I say is going to reinforce what the, the wonderful <laughs> suggestions Ross already made. Um, so there are some broad strands that I think of self-care strategies falling into. One is you're looking after your physical self, you know, good rest, good sleep, um, eating and drinking as well as we can, um, exercise, being outdoors in nature, moving around. Now, these sound like really small and simple things, but I've certainly met colleagues within my team who will spend all day on the ward and not have had a drink of water. And by the end of the day, they have a headache because they're dehydrated. So it really is about taking care of our physical self at a very basic level like that. Um, learning a few simple relaxation techniques. And I use that as a broad umbrella term for techniques that are quite quick to utilize in those moments when we're feeling a little bit anxious or we're in fight or flight mode or we're feeling overwhelmed to just self-soothe a little bit. This looks different for different people. For some people, it's it can be something quite mindful but active. For somebody, it could be a meditation exercise or a breathing exercise. It's really helpful and valuable to learn these skills as human beings because then we have something in our toolkit we can deploy when we are feeling overwhelmed, which we inevitably, all of us do. And using our breath and using our senses, gather our, gather our mind and our body uh, and calm it a little bit. The third thing I'll say is being optimally stimulated can help. Uh, what I mean by that is if you're feeling disinterested, disengaged, and kind of a little bit shut down, maybe you need a little bit more stimulation in your life. And that's where I go back to Ross's suggestion of giving yourself a, a small challenge, learning a new skill, uh, taking up a hobby perhaps, because maybe you need that more stimulation. If you're on the other end of the spectrum and you're feeling frazzled and it really kind of burnt out, then it's really important to 
access restful strategies which, which restore that sense of calm and relaxation. So it's about that optimal level of stimulation. Um, I'm going to use an acronym called ACE, which is ACE. It's to touch on a similar point that Ross made. This comes from a different psychological model. But essentially, it's about the fact that we all need achievement. That's the A. Connection, which is the C. And enjoyment in order to prevent our mood from becoming persistently low. Um, so I would encourage people to try and recall moments or really make a mental note of a moment when you did something you were really proud of, however small that is. You know, if you got a patient in for an appointment when nobody else could do it, for example, or when it seemed really difficult, or if you had a five minute conversation with a friend halfway across the world in your lunch break, these are moments of connection. These are moments of achievement. And it's about really noticing those really small wins and those briefest moments when we have that bond with somebody and we nurture that bond with somebody. Uh, and yeah, just just cultivating presence, you know, even if you only have five minutes. And I know that sometimes, you know, theoretically, we get a 30 minute lunch, but I know most people don't take that long. Take those five minutes, look out of the window while eating your lunch instead of at your computer and your emails. You know, if you're drinking a cup of tea, you know, really look at that cup of tea. Think about think about where it's come from. Think about how tea, tea grows, you know. To, to cultivate that presence in these small moments, that can really help us. Um, the only two other points I'd say about self-care is I think there's a lot of ways in which self-care is talked about, which can be quite um, kind of piecemeal. You know, it's like have that cup of hot chocolate or have a warm bath. These are practical techniques that can help us feel like we're doing something nice and nurturing for, for ourselves. But self-care is also about an ongoing commitment to looking after our health and well-being at a physical and mental level. And for some people at a spiritual level as well. Um, and the other point I want to reiterate, you already said that, Michelle, is that these strategies are for maintaining general good health. They are not recommendations for people who might be really struggling yeah. with mental ill health, uh, for which I think seeking specialist support is the best self-care strategy. And I think that beautifully moves on to Emma's next question for you, actually. Uh, Emma? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Sir Robbie. That's brilliant. I'm definitely nodding along with all these ideas and strategies and thinking about stuff I probably need to do for myself. My next question. Cancer nurses often receive training in having supportive or difficult conversations with patients. But can you tell us a bit about maybe some of the different kinds of local professional support that might be available for nurses that provide these care, this care in these challenging circumstances? Maybe an example from your area. Um, what, what do you think? Sure, sure. And, and I'm glad you said example from my area because well, the first thought I had was, I think I know how much this can vary across different yeah. work environments. And so I wouldn't want to be too specific about that. But I, I will touch on what, what uh, is available, say, in the UK or, or at King's. Um, there's a catalog of kind of communication skills training that's available to nursing staff, uh, advanced communication skills, for example. If you're working in cancer, there is also something called level two psychological skills that all cancer nurses in the UK have access to. This is being revised and updated, but essentially this is about recognizing and giving a framework for the sort of deeper emotional and psychological support work that cancer CNSs tend to do. Um, I, I know that at King's there are, and I, I'm sure this is replicated, that uh, sort of the, the more junior nursing teams on the ward uh, and in outpatient units have access to uh, band five, band six, band seven nursing training days. And our team contributes to that on the psychological well-being and psychological care module, which is usually very well attended and well received. In addition to that, um, there's um, clinical supervision available to, again, cancer CNSs in particular. Um, I know that in certain other departments, other people have set this up, uh, recognizing that the work is emotionally demanding and challenging. Um, I also run a monthly reflective practice session for ward nurses and outpatient unit nurses who might not be clinical nurse specialists, but again, Sometimes the depth and intensity of the emotional work that they do with patients is, is much the same. And this is just a space where they can come and attend monthly in order to just acknowledge emotionally challenging aspects of the work, what it's like to work, work with very sick or dying patients, what it's like to support 
maybe confrontational patients or caregivers, um, recognizing moral distress if that's present. So it's just a re reflective space. And it, it takes me back to the conversation we were having earlier, you were having with Ross around reflection and reflect yeah. and, the, and the merits of that, because it is actually time away from their day-to-day -day job. And sometimes that stepping away can help us open that reflective part and take a bird's eye view on how am I doing? How am I finding this work? Um, so those are some of the things that that we do. And because we're embedded within the team, um, we're also available to offer a specific reflective session uh, after a, a, a sort of an, an incident that might not be that common has occurred or, or a patient's yeah. trajectory a little bit more challenging and has an impact on on the team as a whole. That, that sounds wonderful and very supportive. Um, and I suppose if there's any listeners out there that maybe don't have this set up the similar way, that's maybe a, a thing to do or consider or ask of their organisation. Um, Michelle's got one last question for you, I think, and then we'll do our quick fire round. So over to you, Michelle. Thanks very much, Emma. So this is about uh, mental health first aid, uh, which again is is a, a, a kind of phrase that I, I'm not fully clear clear on. Uh, but we talk about whether people should be trained in mental health first aid. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it, Sarabi, and you know whether you think nurses should be trained in that, or are they already trained? Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question, Michelle. And it's interesting you bring up how that phrase makes you feel because I also have mixed feelings about it. Um, I'm also conscious of not giving a straight yes or no answer to the question of whether nurses should be trained in that as well, because I'm completely aware of all the demands and responsibilities and training that they have to go through to just do the nursing aspects of their jobs. Um, I, I make a distinction between mental health first aid training as the internationally recognized program of um, mental health training and mental health first aid skills. And I think which includes kind of spotting the signs and symptoms of mental ill health, being able to open up a conversation about it in a non-judgmental way, being able to signpost people to avenues for support. And I would argue that a lot of nurses are already doing are already applying mental health first aid skills. What maybe needs to happen perhaps is a formal recognition of that. And uh, some, if training is required, then that put into place to support the skills that nurses are already developing and employing, but also sub, uh, uh, avenues for supervision around that. And by supervision, I mean not kind of seeing whether they're doing a good job, but supervision in the more psychotherapeutic sense of them being, having an opportunity to talk about how doing that feels yes. for them it's not their primary uh what they're primarily trained in yeah yeah that's great that's really helpful just to provide some kind of context or, around that really is is so super helpful okay so we've we're done with the with the big big questions although you know sometimes in our quick fire round which is next uh, we we uncover some big stuff that we didn't quite catch in uh, in the other dialogue. I'm gonna hand over to Emma for the first question, which will be to both of you. Yeah, I think we'll we'll start with Russ because you've been in the background a little bit since uh, we've been having a great conversation with Sarabi. And um, so, what is one of the preconceptions or myths about mental health that you want to challenge? Okay, so here's mine. If you're if you're experiencing thoughts that are unhelpful and perhaps negative, you're not broken. It's okay. That's what our minds have evolved to do to keep us safe. Oh, I like that. Cracking. Yeah. <laughs> you see the big nod from me then. <laughs> yeah. um, and and back to you, Sarabi. What 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 about yourself? What would you like to challenge? Um, for me, particularly thinking about nursing colleagues within hematology, transplant, and cancer, which is my specialism. I think. Uh, the myths that being emotional or deeply affected by your patients' lives and what they're going through is somehow unprofessional. Um, I mean, to quote Shakespeare, give sorrow words, the grief that does not speak knits up the overwrought heart and bids it break. So a myth is that somehow breaking down for your patients is unprofessional is a myth had challenge. Wow, I didn't think we'd ever get Shakespearean quotes in our podcast, Michelle, but wonderful. 
Wonderful. Michelle, you've got the next quick fire question. Uh, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, I love love both of those uh, yes. responses and uh, and and actually the difference in in the responses is is great. Uh, bringing those perspectives and ideas. Uh, what small changes could nursing teams make to improve morale? So a very quite basic, uh, but very important uh, I- ideal. Uh, Ross. Yeah. Okay. So I think asking each other one question as often as possible, hopefully every day. And that question is, what are you doing to recharge your batteries? Nice. It, it, it would normalize the fact that nurses need to look after themselves and they have lives elsewhere. Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. Great. And Sarabi. I'd say appreciate each other more, by which I specifically mean pay more compliments to your colleagues um, for a job well done, even if it's a standard part of your role. Um, I think the positive reinforcement when we don't expect it has such a boost for our confidence and our morale. Yeah. I am um, uh, your your answer your response uh so reminds me I was fortunate enough to uh listen to an incredible speaker earlier this week um uh, a nurse called uh Nicole McIntosh um and uh she uh has uh, I mean like a list of accolades and has done some incredible uh, jobs and roles uh, and currently works for uh, NHS uh, England. And um, she uh, she was known as the smiley nurse on, the, on her ward. And even when she held more senior roles, uh, she was known for her kindness to uh, her colleagues and... Um, and to those uh, those around her, and to her her, her junior nurses as well, and um, and it, it struck me um, uh, because she talked about how that then fed back in for her very positively. So you know, it was almost uh, not a, a a barrier mechanism. It was tr- how she truly felt. She felt happy, so she radiated happiness, and that happiness. Uh, uh, sort of um, gave confidence to those that were working around her, and and you know when difficult situations happened, uh, people didn't feel afraid uh, to speak with her, even when you know she moved up the hierarchy. Uh, and it really struck me that um, that that kindness that we show to each other can reflect back to ourselves in the kindness that we show ourselves as well. And um, I say it sort of really, really struck me um, uh, how such a simple thing, such a simple uh, thing uh, has such a big impact on so many people at so many different levels. Uh, So it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be very, very simple and straightforward. Yeah, Actually, on that note, oh, sorry, Sarabi, you go first. Absolutely. Just say something nice to a colleague. Yeah. You can't imagine the impact it might have on their day. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Emma? Uh, when I was a ward manager, we had a compliments box that staff could compliment each other. And once a month, I would just collate them all and I would print them out and I'd put them up. And it was just, what did your colleague do that was wonderful? What do you want to tell them? that they've done that's wonderful and there were there were always hundreds of them it was wonderful to see you know what what were people saying oh she was so good at that I need to tell her but maybe didn't want to just say it face to face so but I would say face to face is even better personally um okay last quick fire round question so this question is what would be on your list for challenging care environments if you could have, have anything so what would be on your list for for my nurses that are listening or our nurses that are listening today to have anything that you could have what would you want Ross I've got two things on my list oh you're allowed to narrow it down (laughs) you're allowed to have two (laughs) the first thing is to have the voices of expert nurses heard and the second one is to take small steps towards self-care because you're worth it oh we should get badges with that on we should Sarabi what about yourself I'm going to cheat and have 
many things in mm-hmm. under a broad umbrella of one thing. Okay. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> so, so for both of you, your first wish was to have more wishes. More wishes. <laughs> now we are um, very much within the normal normal range of the bell curve of human beings. Um, so a team that functions well is my umbrella. And what I mean by that is where there's compassion for self and others, where there's clear communication, there's transparent decision making, and there's positive feedback. And maybe the second thing I'll cheat and tag along to that is maybe a genuine, nice break room on the ward or on on outpatient units where people can just go and have five minutes of calm and soothing. Without the uh, call buttons and the call buzzers being able to be heard, that would be my wish is yes, the emergency buzzer, but the normal buzzers, we shouldn't be able to hear them when we're on our break. That is not reality. <laughs> no, but 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 honestly, even five minutes of that, yeah, difference. Five minutes of genuine soothing, being in a soothing space. Wonderful wishes, fabulous wishes, Michelle. What about you? Oh Is my you goodness! Um, Put you on the spot, but I'd be interested. Oh yeah, uh, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass. I'm gonna pass to you while I have a think. Well, I mean, one of mine is the buzzers for sure is that is a space where there's no buzzers, but also just little things that we can do to to comp to to give the staff that awareness. So uh, I've done something previous where I've brought in uh, beauticians and they've all been able to go and get a pedicure or a wee shoulder massage or just something to say, thank you so much. You're cared for and we do care that you are well and honestly the colors they picked for their toenails was hilarious so obviously you can't have your fingernails in a clinical environment so there was some very dramatic toenails by the end of that day um so uh, thank you that gave me a little bit of thinking time but I don't think my answer is is really still very good uh but but just the just the ability and the space to be kind to each other. I think that um, uh, it, it's it you know it's it's really important to just have have time to be kind to each other. Um, and that might sound ridiculous because, of course, you know you have time to be kind or mean. You know it's you, mm-hmm. it's a choice almost. But but actually to to be kind and and for that kindness to be felt. Um, uh, I think that that, uh, that would be my my wish. Oh, we're, we're, I like how we're closing off this pod. We've got some positivity, even in a very difficult topic. So uh, with that, we are closing off the pod. And I'm, I'm really very thankful to both Ross and Sarabi for joining us today on a topic that is very, very um, important, but also difficult and as we've said, sometimes we're not very good at looking after ourselves to be able to look after others. So thank you so much for joining us and giving us your insights and uh, for having such a, a challenging conversation with us. It's much appreciated. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you both again. Uh, really appreciated it. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you. And and you guys do take care too. Yes. Please. <laughs> So, Michelle, wow, what a what a thought provoking and emotive podcast today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, gosh, uh, they uh, the, the the topics are brilliant, you know, and we're so lucky to have such incredible experts, topic experts, professional experts uh, in the pod. Uh, I mean, you know how I think how thoroughly relevant. Uh, the whole content uh was today um for me gosh you know the the importance definitely you know my my take homes many many take homes uh but noticing noticing uh in ourselves and noticing in others and being kind I think yeah we're very good at being kind outward but not inward and I think Michelle that Ross and Sarabi did point that to us I think I hope really that the listeners if there are any out there that have been struggling a little bit with distress around and about work or even outside of work that this has kind of reiterated that they're not alone 
and that there are people that are there to help and any help that they go and reach out for is fully confidential that they're, they're it will not affect their ability to go to work if they're seeing somebody on a professional level to help with that distress it's such an important topic that is still not spoken about as much as it should be um and so all those little self-care tips even that will build upon for people and contribute to their so their, their well-being just even in general, even if they're not in distress, but definitely in distress. But I think your word that you finish with there, that kind, it's definitely been hammered home throughout the podcast. And I think it should still be hammered home every time. And I love the tips. I love the idea of what we could do and being curious, but not in a negative way, just in a how how are you genuinely caring? How are you, my colleague? How are you? So I do hope that people who have listened have really gotten something out of the pod today. Um, I would recommend that folk go and find out what their support services are like, even if you don't need it now or you don't think you need it now. It's good to know where they are um, before. Hopefully you don't go into distress, but before you're in distress so that you know where you've got that support already and you don't have to try and find it. Um, so... As always, I'm really appreciative. We are both really appreciative to our listeners for joining us on the podcast today. Um, very thankful to our guests for joining us and giving us such wonderful insights and ideas. And again, I've been writing down my notes like I always do. Um, thank you to our background team who make the podcast a uh, podcast. Um, the technology, the technological support is always wonderful. Um, please do continue to join us. Please do continue to let us know what topics you'd like us to cover um, as we, we very much want to cover what you're interested in. And if you haven't gone through our back catalogue, please do that too and go and find some of our other very cool topics that we've had, haven't we? But thanks for joining me, Michelle, as always. Um, best co-host team ever I think <laughs> thanks very much Emma and again huge thanks to the EBMT team in the background that makes makes all the magic happen thanks again and we'll see you soon and you guys take care out there <laughs> <laughs>